Well, thank you very much, and, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me here. I look forward to the rest of the day as well and, and enjoyed the presentations this morning so far. What I want to talk about um, until lunchtime, so I'm going to talk about food, and I stand between you and food. So I'm very conscious of that, and we'll uh, keep to my allotted time. And I was having a bet whether there would be questions at the end, and <laughs> we'll see what happens. So at any rate, what I want to talk about is, is our food supply and our food system, and talk about some things that we typically don't think about in Michigan, I think, as, um, as tools for economic development that can also impact the public health of the population. And what I, the reason I think this is important to think about is because, of course, we're in a big economic crisis right now, and we have a very high unemployment rate, and we're trying to figure out what the economy of the 21st century is going to look like. And I'm a firm believer, actually, that the basis for our economy needs to be the place that we are and the natural resources that we have in our, in our communities across the state. And one of those resources that we have in abundance right now is water. And one of those, uh, those resources that we have in abundance right now is land. And one of, those uh, one of those resources that we have in abundance right now is people who know how to use that land productively to grow food. Um, being the second most diverse agricultural state in the country, we are actually blessed not just with land and water, but with a wide range of skills um, of people, by people, who know how to produce a wide variety of different crops and animals. And I think that's actually something we can build on to our advantage over the next 10, 15, 20 years. So let me just start out by just telling you where I start and where I think about it. And where I try to think about is what are things that we could agree upon as a population, no matter kind of what our political stripes, what our religious beliefs, no matter what our backgrounds are, is what would we tend to agree with? I think these are four things that we would probably tend to agree on. How we get there, the nuances, huge disagreements. But I don't think we would disagree that we want a vibrant economy that fits the 21st century. Um, and we need to figure out what that's going to be. We want a healthy population with each person able to realize their potential with a particular focus on vulnerable populations. We all want a healthy population. A, so that we can reach our potentials as individuals and as communities and as families and as a state and as a country. But also, of course, we know that unhealthy populations is a drag on the economy. It's a drag on, on families. It's a drag on communities because it costs a lot. It takes up a lot of time in terms of dealing with health issues and other kinds of things. We want sustainable development, which is the purpose of this whole discussion today and what we've been talking about. And we want to preserve and enhance our natural resources for future generations. I don't think any of us want to have to stand up 10, 20 years from now and say, you know, I'm really sorry, but we just used it all up. There's nothing left for you. So we want to preserve and enhance those natural resources for future generations. And when it comes to food, I think numbers are useful and I think they're important to think about. We have a little over 300 million people in the United States. Each of those people need about 1,200 pounds of food annually for a healthy diet. That doesn't count coffee, tea, alcohol, added sugar, added oils, kind of the non-nutritive liquids and, and sweeteners um, and fats that we add to our diet. That's just the, the rest of the food guide pyramid, 1,200 pounds a year. So for 300 million people, we need 360 billion pounds of food. Michigan has 10 million people, so we need about 12 billion pounds of food a year. So when we start talking about sustainable development and, and sustainable agriculture and sustainable food systems and all that, it's not a small amount of food that we're talking about. Now, one of the things that we can say is, is that, and what we increasingly do, is we source that food from all over the world. We have a global food supply. And our food, different numbers, but a reasonable estimate is, is that the average uh, forkful of food that you eat travels about 1,500 miles from the field to your mouth. Um, fruits and vegetables actually travel further and further and further because we continually, um, in, we continually increase our sourcing from non-domestic sources for fruits and vegetables. So one of the solutions that we could say we're going to do is just continue on the path that we're doing and continue to get our food from more and more non-domestic sources, more and more globally, and the food's there, so let's just keep buying it. Okay? Well, one of the things to keep track of is, is that the population's continuing to increase. So the national population is slated to go from about 300 million to about 420 million by 2050. The global population may hit 9.1 billion. We may add another 2.5 billion people to the world. Now, 2.5 billion people need something over 3 trillion pounds of food more a year. So what that means is, is that as we increase this global sourcing and this globalization of the food supply, 
there's an ever-increasing population that needs an ever-increasing amount of food, which means there's going to be an ever-increasing competition for that food and an ever-increasing need to produce more food for everybody to have a diet. That's occurring in a world that's becoming increasingly scarce for fresh water. So 48 countries in the world right now are classified as either water scarce, water scarce or water stressed. That is, they have insufficient fresh water resources to meet the daily needs of their population. Okay. Many of these countries are places that we're increasingly sourcing food from. And those are places that are also continually increasing their own populations. So what does that mean? We have an increasing uh, scarcity of fresh water. We have an increasing need for food in places where food is being exported from and we're importing it from. And there's going to be an increasing competition for that food. One guess out there is, is that when we quit fighting globally over oil, we'll start fighting more and more over water. And in fact, there's those that prognosticate that water will be the next great, um, the next great conflicts will arise over water. And in some parts of the world, we're already there. We're also slated to have another um, six countries or so be classified as water stressed or water scarce over the next 30 or 40 years. So what does this mean? This means that where we're currently increasingly getting our food from and where our food is being distributed and transported from and to us is potentially an increasing source of conflict and an increasingly instable source down the road. Okay? So one solution is to say, well, let's bring it back home. Let's Let's re-domesticate our food supply, in essence, and get it from national sources from across the United States. Well, right now, we get 50% of our domestic fresh fruits and vegetables from California. Okay. That, and so we can just say, whoops, it's not where I wanted to go. There's supposed to be another bullet there. So what we could be doing is just saying, let's get it from there. But if we look at California, and in fact, look across the country, all the red areas of, on that map of the United States are areas that the American Farmland Trust has classified as areas of highly productive farmland that are under high threat of development. Almost all of that red in California is places that currently produce most of the fruits and vegetables that come out of there. You can see the same thing in Michigan. Places that you'll notice that are very highly productive in terms of fruits and vegetables in Michigan are also under threat of development. Right now, that threat is reduced because of the economy and because of the lack of development. But as the economy recovers, we can anticipate that that development will start to recover as well. In fact, they estimate that about 86% of our current domestic production of fruits and vegetables comes out of um, threatened areas, areas of, uh, under high pressure. Now, that is coupled with public health issues. From a public health standpoint, a study was done by USDA a while back that said, okay, let's say that everybody woke up tomorrow and started eating a healthy diet. With respect to fruits and vegetables, that would mean about a doubling of the consumption in the United States. Three things would happen at that point. There'd be a run on the supermarkets and that section of fresh produce would be empty. Second thing that would happen is every nutritionist in the country would faint. And the third thing that would happen is we'd find out that we're about 13 million acres short of production. So in other words, right now, our agricultural system is incapable of providing all the, fresh, all the fruits and vegetables, whether they're fresh, frozen, or canned, that are recommended for consumption by all the public health authorities in the United States. Okay? Now, to put a perspective on that, 13 million acres is two to three Californias. So it's a lot of produce. In terms of our total agricultural lands, it's a relatively small amount. We're talking 3 4% of our agricultural land. So it's not a huge amount of agricultural land. It's a large amount of, of production of fruits and vegetables. Okay? And as I said, where we get it right now is California. So we could think about, let's increase that production in California. Well, keep track of, of this. California right now has about 36 million people. Demographic projections say they're going to grow to about 50 million people by 2050. 14 million people that need land, that need roads, that need places to work, and those businesses take up land, and that need fresh water. And right now, California is in a drought. The Central Valley of California this summer is producing about 800,000 acres less crops than they did several years ago because there's insufficient water. We can anticipate that as population increases in California, there will be increasing competition for fresh water. Agriculture typically loses in those scenarios. Climate change projections indicate that if we're at all close to where we think we're going with climate change, that the snowpack runoff that's irrigating almost all of that fruit and vegetable acreage in California could decline by 70% in the next 30 to 40 years. So, 
decline of freshwater resources because of a decline of snowpack runoff, increasing population taking up both land and water, what we probably can anticipate is a decline of agricultural production in California over the next 30 or 40 years. So where we get half of our production of fresh fruits and vegetables today, when my 11-year-old my daughter is my age, probably is not going to be there. So where is she going to get her food? Well, that actually provides an opportunity. And that opportunity is to, is to move more forcefully in a direction which a lot, of, a lot of is happening already on right now. And that is, is to think about dispersing that agricultural production across the country. Many people think about that as local food systems. People think about that as going to farmers markets, as doing all these things to buy Michigan, to buy Indiana, to buy Illinois, to buy wherever you're living at the time. Okay? We can also think about that as national security. If we don't have a solid food supply, what do we have? We, I think we all like to eat every day, and I bet you all want to eat at noon. Um, and so one of the things that we can think about is the opportunity that's endemic in thinking about sustainability and thinking about the future in not thinking about destroying the global food supply and saying, well, we shouldn't just import anything. We need a global food supply. We need a national domestic food supply. But we also need to think about rebalancing our portfolio of where we source food from and seeing about how that can be turned into an advantage from a whole host of standpoints. Okay? So what we think about is, is that what we need to re-engage is locally integrated food systems. That is, food systems in communities across the state and across the country that are a dynamic blend of locally sourced and regionally sourced, nationally sourced, and globally sourced. And we think about it in this way with the criteria for local is that if we can get it from local sources, why don't we do that? Why don't we think about how that can be an advantage in our communities and, and an economic development tool, a public health promotion tool, an educational tool, a land preservation tool, a tool for all kinds of things in our community? If we can't do that, and there's things that we want in that food, whether it's organic or whether it's local or low pesticide use and IPM and all that kind of stuff, let's make sure that when we're getting it from other places, it's got those same characteristics in it. And, it's, and if it's from outside, then are those, can we, do we know that those characteristics are there? Okay. Now, one of the things that we've been finding is, is that if we think about the food system in our local communities, in fact, that the food system, because it's something that everybody does, it's something that's parts of all of our cultures, there's been a lot of, of cross-cultural fusion because of food, and we've learned from each other. We've learned to enjoy foods from different cultural backgrounds of new immigrants as they come to this country, and some open restaurants, and we learn to enjoy the food that's in those restaurants, and some we learn how to cook it. We want those things in the grocery stores. But we find that that food system then becomes a tool for approaching all kinds of problems in the community. And we find that if we have an emphasis on access and equity and sustainability and relationships, and getting things as local as feasible um, through sustainable use of our local resources, it's actually a tool for bringing the community together. Okay. So we can identify opportunities, and, and, and that's what I want to talk about. So for us, then, in the work that we do in, in the Mott Group, and that we work with people all across the country, including people here in, in Grand Rapids, which, which the Greater Grand Rapids Food System Council and others, is to think about a strategy where we're linking health, farming, economics, and environment. And where our focus on health is for people maintaining a quality standard of life as they mature in age. I've got a grandmother who's 101. And um, my goal is to be like her. Her secret to life is that she has a six pack of beer a week. She has one beer a day, Monday through Saturday, none on Sunday. <laughs> so, so that's my goal in life. <laughs> Second thing is the environment, is that we want to maintain our natural resource base. Economics, we want vibrant rural and urban communities. And farming, we want a diversity of viable farms. Okay. Now, we've done several studies looking at, so is there really opportunity here? Is there opportunity for thinking about linking up public health, economic development, and farming as a viable occupation that, in fact, young people can be encouraged to go into instead of being encouraged to run from as fast as they can? So one of the things we looked at is we said, OK, there is this public health gap with respect to fruit and vegetable consumption. We know that people, on average, consume about half of what they should. Um, we know that the average male in this room should be conserving, consuming about nine servings a day of fruits and vegetables. The average female in here, about seven. It's based on caloric recommendations. Um, and so what if we bridge that public health gap, that gap between what we do consume and what we should consume? And what if we then said, 
that what we want to look at is make an assumption that people aren't going to radically shift. We're not going to quit eating bananas. We're not going to quit eating oranges or drinking orange juice or a lot of these tropical fruits and vegetables that we're just not going to grow here, especially the fruits. But just eat more of whatever it is you're currently eating, twice as much of everything you're doing now, eat more of it. And then let's say, what if we take all the things that we can grow in Michigan, so we're not going to grow oranges, but we can grow tomatoes. We're not going to grow bananas, but we can grow strawberries. And let's look at the time of the year when we can get those fresh, reasonably, without using um, season extension technology. So strawberries, we can get about a month a year. Blueberries, maybe a month and a half, two months. Apples with controlled atmosphere storage, we can have fresh for 10 months. And so let's just take that portion of what we eat that we can grow in Michigan, and that time of the year when we can get it fresh, and say, OK, what would that mean to the Michigan economy if, if 10 million people actually did that? Now, just to give you an idea, that increase is only about the amount that we would get from fresh local sources would only be maybe 10 to 15 percent of the actual need that we have to increase our consumption. So 85 percent of it would still be coming from other places in this scenario. Okay? But that 10 or 15 percent is about 37,000 more acres of production. Now, the average fruit and vegetable farm in Michigan is something like about 45 or 50 acres which for a new farmer would be a very big farm because a new farm is probably going to start out at maybe three, four, or five acres if it's a beginning farmer that is just getting going and just trying to figure out what they're doing. And over a 10 or 12 year period, they may get to 25 or 30 or 40 acres. So 37,000 acres of production is a lot of production. It's a lot of farms and it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of um, farming. But those 37,000 acres would actually generate $200 million of money in the pockets of farmers across the state of Michigan. And that $200 million um, dollars would generate 1,800 off-farm jobs and two to three times that many on-farm jobs because of the work of growing 37,000 acres of produce. And remember, that's only 10 to 15 percent of that public health gap. And it's none of what we're currently consuming. So what does that mean? That means actually that thinking about relocalizing our food system and thinking about these locally integrated food systems and using that as part of the toolkit for economic development of the state in Michigan has real opportunity. It is not the only solution. There is no magic bullet to Michigan's economy. But there's components to the toolkit. And this is one component of the toolkit that I think quite frankly and quite bluntly we've largely ignored to now. And, and I think that's a mistake. So the second next thing to think about is, okay, let's say that we want to we put in a concerted effort to say, okay, so let's increase the amount of acreage that's going into local marketing and local consumption. Simultaneously, we'll work on the consumer side to work at getting people to, to consume more produce and to think about buying local and when they can and things like that. What would it take, in fact, to generate new farmers? Because one of the issues that we have out there right now is that the farming population is aging to some degree. And the traditional way of generating farmers, that is, kids grew up on a farm, went to Michigan State, um, the land grant, or some other university, and got education in what, what's been called scientific agriculture, came back to the farm, and at some point when the father was ready to retire, retired, and the son took over, which was the typical transition. Well, nowadays, what's happening? They're still going away to the universities oftentimes, but they're not coming back. And so that way of generating farmers is largely broken. There's still some of that, and there's some important opportunities out there that, that young people in high school now that are in from farm families are taking advantage of with FFA and some other things to learn about new opportunities in agriculture. But that's not going to generate the types of farms, the numbers of farms that you, you might think about in terms of, of a toolkit for building the new economy. So one of the things we need to think about is, so how would we go about training new cohorts of people that want to farm? And I'll get to a second in who those cohorts might be because there's groups out there that actually provide interesting opportunities. Well, one is training. Okay? One is training. People need to learn how to produce in ways that can, that can produce for these kinds of markets in the kinds of ways that people want to get their food from, and et cetera, et cetera. So for example, at MSU, there's the two-year organic farming certificate program, which brings people in in January, has a year of on-campus um, classroom and, and experiential learning in which they learn how to produce organic fruits and vegetables year-round in unheated hoop houses and outside. And we need more of those kinds of things across the, across the state. The second thing is to remember 
that these farms are in fact businesses. And no matter how much it's nice to be able to grow things, if you want to grow it commercially, it is in fact a business. And figuring out what your market's going to be and, and how much can you make out of a 3,000 square foot hoop house and et cetera, et cetera, is an important thing to do. So building that as a business is an important thing to do. Many people who are coming out who want to go into farming now don't have a land base in their family background that they can draw on. They're not coming from a farm family. So how do these people access land? Five, 10 acres, right now you can probably go out in the country and buy 10 acres for something under $100,000 that would be decent land. That may not, that at that point probably wouldn't have a house on it. $100,000 is still a lot of money for somebody who's just coming out of college or someone who's second career who just got unemployed or someone who's a new immigrant to this country. So figuring out ways that people can get access to land so that they can go about the business of growing food and building a business that can support their families while providing good, healthy food to people in Michigan is an important piece of this. While also recognizing that historically, land has been the retirement package for farmers. And so you talk about farmers being cash poor and land rich. And so what's happening right now is there's a lot of land that's being, tra that's being transitioned that's providing the retirement package for the farmers that are 70, 80, 90 years old at this point. Now, if that's not going to be the case with these new people coming up, then part of that viability of that business has to be them figuring out a way where in 30 or 40 years they can retire. Okay. Capital. Susan Cacciarelli in our group right now is doing a, a research project with lenders to look at what it would take for them to look at these kinds of things as lending opportunities. One of the biggest issues that beginning small farmers start to identify um, as a problem for them is access to credit. Um, for those of you not familiar with individual development accounts, IDAs are, is a program of the federal government for um, low-income people to build assets with the idea that getting a job is great, but the way you really get out of poverty is building assets. And the three things they've identified as assets is higher education, a house, or starting a business. And so Susan, with, with grant from the federal government here in western Michigan, has started a, a new farm IDA program. And there's about 16 of these that are out there right now, and I think there's five that have been completed. So there's five people who completed an IDA where they save 1,000. It's matched with 1,000 of federal money and 1,000 of private money. So that $1,000 becomes $3,000 that can then, can then be utilized to catalyze the beginning of a business. In this case, they're focused on new farms. So there's now five farms in western Michigan that have been started with IDAs. And three of those, I believe three of those, took no other money. They just did that and then sales to get their business going. Another one used that and I think five acres of land that they had as collateral for a $30,000 loan from the bank and they used that to start their business. So there's ways that we can think about, about working with the credit industry, working with the federal government and some of these programs that are out there to help people generate the capital needed to start these businesses. And then there's market development. If you're starting a new small farm, two, three acre farm, realistically, you've got to get as much of the food dollar out of what's coming off that farm as possible. Because if you're growing anything legal, you're not going to get rich on three acres. But what you can get is you can get a reasonable return on your investment. And so the important thing here is to think about direct market opportunities, farmers markets, on-farm farm stands, community supported agriculture operations, and things like that. So now there's an, a new entity in the state that's been here for a couple of years called the Michigan Farmers Market Association that runs out of, the, out of MIFS, the Michigan um, Food and Farming Systems uh, NGO. And what they do is they help do training for new market managers, for farmers that want to do direct marketing and all that. They also play an important role of having group insurance for liability at farmers markets because many farmers who sell at farmers markets have no liability insurance. And that, that, that could be a real problem, right? Somebody slips on lettuce and oops. Um, and so now you can get million dollar coverage, liability coverage for $300 a year through MIFMA. And finally, continuing information. Because especially people who, are, who don't have a history in farming, they didn't grow up with what we can think of as that common sense of farming, the thing that you get from the daily operations on a farm. And so they have to keep learning over and over and over again, new things, new strategies, new techniques. I knew a farmer back in New Jersey, I was at Rutgers for 20 years, who was a CPA in his first career and an organic farmer in his second career. And he started out his first year growing a quarter acre of produce and having 14 shareholders of a CSC. I think his net income that year was $2,000. He had a second job. And he, used to, he loved to backpack. Every Christmas, he'd get a seed order in. He'd travel to the Southwest. He'd backpack for a couple weeks. And he'd go to California. He'd visit organic farms and see what they were doing on weed management, on fertility, and all these kinds of things. And he learned. 
and he'd come back and he'd incorporate that. Twelve years later, he's got, he's a C, he was a CSA with, 20, with 25 acres of production, 1,400 families he's feeding, and $750,000 of gross income. Pretty big CSA. Okay. So that brings up the question of who will farm in the future. I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly. Okay. And I actually think that there's three groups of people that are the farmers of the future. And, and one of the things that we have to confront, I think, in, in my opinion at least, as a society and as a state, is are we going to develop the programs that will help these people move into farming and providing food for us on a daily and a yearly basis in a way that doesn't guarantee their success, because that's not what we do in this country, but in a way that provides the opportunities for success. So one of those are people that grew up on the farms. And so we have places like Springport FFA, which is south of Lansing. Springport's a community south of Lansing, in which that FFA program is doing a lot of innovative value-added agriculture to, to, so these high school students can see what it's like. Many of those students grew up on farms. Immigrants. There are a lot of immigrant populations, whether they're refugee or whether they're migrant farm workers, however they came to this country, many of them have farming backgrounds. Many of them make excellent farmers. Hispanic farmers is the fastest growing group of farmers in, in Michigan today. There's over uh, 1,100 Hispanic farms in Michigan today. And there could be many, many more. In many cases, they need to learn what, what is different about farming in the United States compared to their home country. How do you do markets? What kind of crops do people like? Because many of the things that they would grow in their home country are things that would not sell in the marketplace in the United States today, except in a very small niche markets. So there's a lot of training opportunities that are needed there, but a lot, of, a lot of vibrancy, a lot of energy, and a lot of intelligence about how to take care of the land. And then there's new generation farmers, like we find at the Organic Farming Certificate Program at MSU. Many of these are, are college-age students. Quite frankly, many of these are, and I, I started a student organic farm at Rutgers, and so I, I, I know this. Um, many of these are students, they come in with, because to farming because they're interested in the environment. And so they're interested in organic farming because they think that that's the only thing that's environmental. And they think that if you just throw some stuff in the ground, it'll grow and we can walk around barefoot. I'm exaggerating a little bit and I apologize for that. <laughs> can walk around barefoot or at least in Birkenstocks and everything will be nice. But my contention is, is that about a month and a half of 90 degree temperature being outside taking care of weeds kills that, takes care of that real quick. And what comes out then is a passion for doing something because it's something that they love to do. So there's 14 students right now in this program, in the program this year at MSU. Twelve of those are really determined to be farmers in Michigan. And we need to encourage that. And then there's second career. You know, there, we've got an awful lot of people that are unemployed right now, and some of those people at that OFCP program are second career people. They were in the auto industry. They've always had a passion for gardening. Now they want to come back and figure out, can I turn that into a passion for farming and generate a, a career for myself? You know, my contention is, is that a lot of these second career people in Michigan, one of the things that will never happen is the tractors will never break down. Okay. Now, that said, we are seasonally challenged in Michigan. We have a relatively short growing season. And I think this is going to be classified as the summer that never was because my tomatoes still don't have any tomatoes on them outside because it's been so cool. Well, one of the things that we know we can do now is that we can extend the season, and we can extend the season sustainably and in an environmentally friendly way. This looks like a greenhouse, and it is a greenhouse, except for one thing. There's no fossil fuel energy going into that, except for some electricity for a blower, um, for an electric fan. Because there's no propane, there's no oil, there's no heat in this thing. The only heat in this is what the sun is what's captured from the sun. These are unheated hoop houses. In those unheated hoop houses in Michigan, we know from research of John Birnbaum at MSU and others there and others across the country, that we can grow about 30 different crops inside those unheated hoop houses 12 months a year. They generate fresh produce for their uh, CSA members 48 weeks a year. The four weeks they take off are because the students are gone, not because there's no crop in the ground. And so there's three layers of plastic there. What those plants see is basically St. Louis, Missouri in the middle. Of, right now it's St. Louis, Missouri in there, which is my hometown. Um, and so what we know is, is that we can put these things up we can generate some, a good farmer can generate probably $8,000 a year of gross income from one of those 3,000 square foot high tunnels. And they can pay themselves back on a gross basis in a couple years if you do it right. These things are now all over the, all over the state. Um, John and Adam Montra have done probably workshops for about 1,500 people around the state. About 1,200 of those are farmers. We've got those sited on 12 farms right now to look at the economics and the production potential of those. Um, and those are all ones that are selling into farmers markets at this point. 
and they're starting to go up in urban areas to look at farming in the urban areas and we can talk more about that at some point. Okay. The point is, is that we can now extend the season and we can generate Michigan fresh produce 12 months a year in an environmentally friendly way. The question is, if you produce it in the middle of the winter, will people come? So one of the things that we're doing from a research standpoint is looking at market attendance at farmers markets at places where we've got these high tunnels sited um, right now with money from the USDA. And so if you ask people, when did you come to the farmers market? And if any of you go to farmers market, it's probably May or later is when you start going. First of all, you don't get a lot of Michigan product at the farmers market if you're going before May because um, most of what you're getting is imported from someplace and it's being resold. And if you are getting stuff from Michigan, it's not that diverse. Maybe you're getting some broccoli, maybe you're getting some lettuce if you're going in early May. One of the things about those high tunnels that's true is, is not only can we produce 12 months a year, but we can, for example, produce tomatoes inside those hoop houses, where outside right now in Lansing, like I said, I still don't, I, I have one tomato on 26 plants. And I got a bunch of flowers, but I don't have tomatoes. Now, Inside the hoop houses, my friend Adam Montre, who works at MSU, but he and his wife Drew have a farm, and in their high tunnel, they've been marketing tomatoes to their, to their um, customers for the last six weeks. So what you do is you marketly expand the season when you can get those outdoor crops to market by growing them indoors. So tomatoes, you're going to extend the season on tomatoes in one of those things by about three months, as an example. So what people said was that they were mostly coming in May or later. They said, if there was product available, I'd like to come a lot earlier. I'd like to shop Michigan product at a farmer's market a lot earlier as there's product. I usually come sometime September, October, November, December, depending on what's available. I'd like to come a lot later if the product was there. So what does that say to us? Now this is, of course, intention and not actuality. The actuality would probably be somewhat less than this. But what that says to us, is, in fact, is that there's a huge opportunity not only to produce on the farm across an extended season, but to market because there's customers willing to buy. So that presents an opportunity in our opinion. Okay. The, the, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that is not to forget that we have a huge disparity in this state and in this country in who purchases fresh fruits and veg in, in who purchases fruits and vegetables and how much they purchased. And that's primarily an economic situation. So the lowest quintile of income in the United States spends about one-third as much money per year on fruits and vegetables as the highest quintile. So there's issues there. One of the ways that people are thinking about getting around this, and I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to go quick here, is um, how can we think about expanding the ability of food stamps, now called SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, how can we expand the possibility for those to for those stamps to be used to purchase fresh fruits and vegetables. So there's a program out there that's being tried in the philanthropic world right now. It started in Connecticut with a foundation connected with Robert Redford um, and others to basically match EBT expenditures with philanthropic funds when it's used to purchase fresh fruits and vegetables at a farmer's market. So somebody with EBT goes to a farmer's market in Detroit, they spend $10, they spend $20 on produce there's actually only $10 deducted from their EBT card. The farmer gets $20, but $10 of that's coming from philanthropic money and $10 of it's coming from the EBT card. So you can essentially double the purchasing power at farmers markets. And so several things now that are in the works in Michigan is um, how would we think about increasing a network of corner markets, farmers markets, and youth farm stands, which I'll talk about in just a second. So for example, there's work in Detroit with the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation. There's work by the Michigan Farmers Market Association. There's work by the Eastern Market in Detroit to think about how to extend the capacity to source fresh produce from Michigan farmers at, at markets inside um, underserved areas. Um, part of the issue there is that many farmers markets are not EBT accessible um, because of the fact that it's like a credit card. So there are program, there's a program that we're trying to get developed out there to make all the farmers markets that want to be EBT accessible be accessible. And there's some great models out there across the state and across the country of doing just that. And then there's the supplemental program that I talked about. And then the final piece then is what we think right now is, is that if every community in Michigan that wanted a farmers market had a farmers market, they wouldn't be able to because there's not enough farmers. And so the other piece of that is how do we increase the market capacity 
of farmers and farms in Michigan to service all those farmers markets that want to develop. Okay. The last piece of this, or one of the last pieces then, and this I'll go through even faster, is to think about it's not just about growing food in our rural areas, but there's also opportunities, depending on the urban area in Michigan across the country, to think about the urban areas as key growing points. So we take a place like Detroit. Grand Rapids is a little bit more dense. There's a little bit less open space than some of the other areas over here on the western side of the state. But on a, on a different scale, I think this is also a reasonable thing to think about here. Detroit, remember, for those of you who aren't f totally familiar, Detroit has a very large footprint. Boston, Manhattan, and San Francisco would all fit inside Detroit with room to spare. That's how big Detroit is. Okay? Used to be a population of 2 million, now it's a pop in the 50s, now it's a population of 900,000. Well, a graduate student of mine, Catherine Colasante, just finished her master's degree, and we looked at all the publicly owned open space in Detroit that's not a park or a right-of-way. So publicly owned space with no buildings on it in Detroit is about 5,000 acres, and that's just the publicly owned with no buildings whatsoever. And we modeled out, if Detroit wanted to, how much fruit and vegetable production could Detroit generate for itself? All that green are all the vacant parcels in Detroit, just to give you an idea. This is an, an aerial photo, if you can see the green uh, rectangles. Those are all publicly owned parcels inside a relatively sparsely vacant area of Detroit that are publicly owned. And this is an area where there's a lot of open space. So all of those rectangles are publicly owned parcels in Detroit, in this area of Detroit, with absolutely no buildings on them. It's a large amount of land. And when we model it out, in fact, if we look at season ex using season extension technology, using post-harvest management storage like controlled atmosphere storage of apples, and we look at commercial yield production, which means you're producing at a scale where you're not doing dense plantings, but you're doing planting so the tractors can be used and all that, it would take less than that public land, about 3,600 acres in Detroit, to generate 75% of the vegetables and 42% of the fruits that are currently consumed by the residents of Detroit. In other words, there's actually a huge opportunity to think about production inside some of our core urban areas. There's a lot of issues there that we're not going to go into now, and I think you can probably come up with a lot of them. Another piece of that is how do we think about getting our youth involved and get, having them involved as a key part of the solution to creating a sustainable food system in Michigan? You know, the classic joke is where does milk come from? It comes from a plastic container. Um, nobody knows where their food comes from these days, right? So how do we start rebuilding that education to the extent that we want to and so that, so that youth understand that, in fact, diet and the food that we consume is an important part of our long-term health, it's an important part of building our economy, and it's an important part of not stressing the health care system down the road. So one of the things that we've got going in across the state is we serve as, as technical assistance for um, a number of programs that are youth farm stands, which is a combination of giving youth an entrepreneurial experience and letting them see what it's like to run a small business, doing that through the aegis of selling produce in their community. In some cases, they're growing that produce themselves, and in some cases, they're getting it from local farmers at wholesale and then marking it up and reselling it. Okay? And Ann Scott, who runs this, developed a, a manual for it and all kinds of things that people can use. When we get beyond kind of these direct market venues, the other thing to think about is, is there's also a lot of opportunities with institutional markets. Probably the hottest thing right now nationally is farm to school programs. That is getting local agricultural products into the K through 12 and increasingly into the university and, and college school food services. Okay. This is a survey we did five years ago. We're getting ready to redo it this fall and see what the five year update is. And one of the questions was querying food service directors across the 680 some odd school districts in Michigan and asking, if you could, would you like to get Michigan agricultural product into K through 12 lunch? 75% of those that responded said yes. That's 384 school districts um, across the state of Michigan. And I can tell you that in fact, there are a lot of school districts that are looking at how they can do this right now. There are challenges to it. The biggest challenge is 250. The amount the tip food service director typically has to put a lunch on the, on the, uh, the plate for a kid, $2.50. About 40 to 60% of which is taken up by labor and infrastructure costs. So the average food service director has about a dollar to buy the food, which I don't know if any of you ever tried to put a good lunch on your plate for a dollar's worth of food. It's very hard to do. Okay. So that's the biggest challenge. And we'll talk about, I'll just mention that in a second. Yep, and I'll be done in two minutes. 
Okay? In fact, I might be done in one. So with that in mind then, I actually think that there's a lot of things that we can do from a policy standpoint that as a starting point don't cost the state or local governments anything unless they want it to. And longer range may be a matter of deciding what are our priorities going to be. So for example, with respect to things like school lunch programs and K through 12 school lunch, at the federal level with the last farm bill, the USDA did come out with a memo saying that geographic preferencing was allowable um, in the under $100,000 purchase um, threshold. So they, for the first time, said that they would not oppose, in fact, that they considered it legal to use geographic preferencing as one of your, your, your bidding criteria when you were searching out product for the school lunch program. Okay? Well, that opened a door. That opened a big door, because prior to that, they said geographic preferencing was illegal and you couldn't do it. And some food service directors were doing it anyway, they just were keeping it quiet. And so what that meant was, was that up to $100,000 for a particular bid, they could restrict to Michigan or to Grand Rapids area or whatever they wanted to do. The problem was, at that point, our state level restrictions was $18,000. So there was an $82,000 gap between what the Fed said we could do and what the state said we can do. So a year ago or so, um, the House and the Senate and the governor signed two bills, 6365 and 6366, that raise that purchasing threshold at the, at the state level for geographic preferencing to $100,000 to the federal level for intermediate school districts and for local school districts. It didn't say that the locals had to do anything. It still gives the local school districts the right to restrict to whatever they want to in terms of their com competitive bidding process. But what it said is the state's not going to be an impediment relative to the federal government. So now if a local school district allows it, a food service director has the ability to do geographic preferencing on sourcing of the food for the school lunch program up to a $100,000 bid. So they can buy Michigan apples, they can buy Michigan cherries, they can buy Michigan broccoli, they can do whatever they want. Okay? Now, the issue though then becomes what if, the problem though is again getting back to that 250 for lunch. Federally, there's a large number of groups that are advocating for larger reimbursement rates for the school lunch program. And one of the things that we've thought about here in the state is, is what if we took some economic development money and instead of putting it directly into business development, put it into things like the school lunch program and drive the development of businesses through the consumer, through the purchasing practices of various, of various entities around the state. So what if we took 10 cents of economic development money and added it to, the school, to a school meal reimbursement with the idea that that 10 cents had to be used to purchase Michigan agricultural product as a starting point. Well, there's 140 million meals served a year in Michigan. If it was 100% um, implementation, it would be $14 million a year of expenditure, which in the scheme of things, on the one hand is a lot of money, on the other hand is not a lot of money. So there's ways, I think, that we can think about helping to drive this local agricultural production as an economic development tool in fairly simple ways. So in conclusion, then, I think that there's actually tremendous opportunities for utilizing a locally integrated food system as a key component of our smart growth, our economic development, our youth development, and our public health toolkit. I think linking these things together is the only thing that makes sense and is smart um, in the era that we live in right now. And with that, I'll close and say thank you very much and enjoy lunch. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. You're welcome.